and fire year. Responding to and mitigating threats to communities will come to order. Welcome and thank you for joining today's hearing. After brief opening remarks, members will receive testimony from our witness today, and then the hearing will be open to questions. Members will be recognized in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members, and in order of arrival for those members who have joined us after the hearing was called to order. When you are recognized, you will be asked to unmute your microphone and we'll have five minutes to ask your questions or make a comment. If you are not speaking, I ask that you remain muted in order to minimize background noise. In order to get as many questions as possible, the timer will stay consistently visible on your screen. I wanna thank everyone for uh, joining us today for this very important and timely hearing on the 2021 wildfire season. We have all seen the heartbreaking uh, footage of the wildfires that continue to rage in the West and have been raging in the West so far this year. The fires are terrifying and I stand ready to do whatever I can as chair of this subcommittee to ensure that the Forest Service has the resources, the personnel and the tools they need to prepare for future fires and respond to the wildland fires already raging. It is also imperative that we make sure firefighters on the ground are compensated fairly and given adequate time away from this intense and dangerous work. And I think I speak for everyone here today when I say that America's firefighters embody our nation's highest ideals of courage, commitment, and selflessness towards their fellow Americans. Unfortunately, as we head into the heart of wildfire season, or as it's become wildfire years after years, uh, we are expected to have yet another unprecedented year of dangerous and deadly wildfires ahead of us. And as we speak, there are currently more than 60 wildfires raging in the United States across 3 million acres of land uh, and, and in much of the land represented by some of the members of this subcommittee and certainly members of the larger committee. While the volume of wildfires may be unprecedented, the story before us is a familiar one. In the short time that I've chaired this subcommittee, I've presided over a wildfire hearing each year that begins with news exactly um, about what has happened in that year's wildfire season, and each year it's worse than the last. In fact, it was almost exactly a year ago that we sat here and had a hearing nearly identical as the Rattlesnake, the Creek, the SCU Lighting Complex, and the El Dorado fires, among others, devastated the Western United States. And at that hearing, I compared the situation in the West to another environmental crisis that faced much of the United States in the 1930s, the, the Dust Bowl. And during that period, there was a sense that Congress did not understand the severity of the problems facing America's farmers and families living in the midst of an environmental crisis. And despite demands for action by both the administration and those impacted by the dust storm for years, Congress failed to act in a comprehensive manner, and it was not until March of 1935 when the dust from the Midwest reached the Capitol steps and lawmakers were forced to see it and experience it with their own eyes that a compromise could be reached on what became the first federal conservation bill, the Soil Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act of 1936. It should not take the ash of these wildfires or the debris and floodwaters of hurricanes ravaging our coast or the severe heat felt by millions across the nation and across the globe on a daily basis. Uh, it should not take that reaching the Capitol steps for us, for Congress to take action on the environmental crisis we're currently facing. Uh, th through the House Agriculture Committee section of the proposed Build Back Better Act, the committee is taking action. This bill marked up by this committee just a few weeks ago contains $14 billion for hazardous fuel treatments on national forest system, system lands, a billion dollars for critical vegetation management, $9 billion in grants for state and private forestry for hazardous fuel treatments, millions of dollars in grants for recovery and rehabilitation of areas affected by wildfires, $50 million for post-fire recovery plans, and would remove the cap on the Reforestation Trust Fund, building on the Replant Act, which was introduced by our colleague, Congressman Panetta, who serves on this subcommittee. Uh, and this is a piece of legislation that I'm proud to co-lead, and I know the ranking member uh, is also a co-lead of this important legislation. What's more, this bill squarely takes aim at combating the crisis uh, by investing in clean energy jobs, climate smart conservation practices at USDA, and the creation of a civilian climate corps uh, as called for in my bill, the Climate Stewardship Act. Of course, climate is not the only factor contributing to the intensity of wildfires. 
um, in the wildfire seasons. We know that many factors are involved in the current wildfires and our wildfire risk. Uh, encroachment of housing developments on forested wildlands, forest management decisions and resources, fire management, weather events, the actions of people, uh, like the use of pyrotechnic devices. Uh, and the list, unfortunately, continues. In addition, there's still more that must be done to protect Americans from wildfires, make impacted communities whole, and ensure the U.S. Forest Service has the tools they need to respond to and combat wildfires, all while combating the climate crisis. Managing our forests to mitigate future wildfire risk is a steep but not insurmountable task, and former Fire Service Chief Vicki Christensen testified recently that we need to treat an additional 20 million acres of forest lands over the next 10 years to make progress in reducing our wildfire risk. I am looking forward to the conversation about how we can make that happen. Um, and before we begin the discussion, I do want to congratulate uh, Randy Moore on his new role as chief of the U.S. Forest Service. As a regional forester, Chief Moore has been a leader among his peers on issues relating to conservation, combating the climate crisis, responding to wildfires. Chief Moore's appointment to this role uh, is historic. He's also the first African American to hold this role in the history of the United States Forest Service. I was excited to have a chance to speak with Chief Moore in advance of this hearing, learn about some of his experiences, the place he's places he's worked throughout the United States. Um, and I look forward uh, to hearing more from him today. I have uh, the utmost confidence in his leadership and the vision that he brings to the U.S. Forest Service, and I appreciate him joining us today to answer our questions. With that, I thank our speaker for joining us. I look forward to the discussion, and I'll now recognize the ranking member for any remarks that he'd like to make at the outset of this hearing. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I greatly appreciate uh, us having this opportunity to have this very important hearing today and, and cover the subject as, as, it, as it greatly needs to be and, and ongoing. I, I also appreciate your comments and your statement, too, about uh, you know, the, it took the, the dust from the Dust Bowl to reach the steps of the Capitol to get action. And we hope that we don't have to with uh, the smoke and the ash from this, and yet, indeed, some of that smoke and ash has already just from this year reached back here. Indeed, you'd see that there'd be health advisory warnings to not go outside and exercise from fires coming from my district and some of my neighboring district colleagues as well. So, so I, I appreciate that comment and that sentiment. So, so with that, welcome Chief Moore and thanks for being with us on the big screen, although you're on the small screen right now there. Is that Mount Shasta behind you there perhaps? Or? <laughs> Hard to tell from here. It, it could very well be Mount Shasta. Okay. Um, so as, as, uh, as we've talked about here a little bit, like so many others who live in the West or near forests, of course, it's an extremely important and personal issue to me and so many that I represent. So I want to first recognize our firefighters who have done the, the hard work on the ground, who risk their lives each day to confront these disasters head on. And there's nothing like when um, I was up on uh, visiting the fires myself on the, the Dixie fires we know, right near the town of Greenville, just after Greenville was consumed by one, just a few miles up the road is another town called Canyon Dam that uh, they were gracious enough to take me by. And as, as we arrived there, we only had minutes to even view Canyon Dam as the orange, as the orange wall of heat and flame was only about a mile down the road and as as we in the group said I guess we may need to turn around and head back because uh, it was incredible the roar of that fire the wind that it created a 50 mile an hour swirl of wind and just minutes later the town of Canyon Dam was gone so so our firefighters are out there having to deal with that and trying to figure out how to stay out of the way at, at the same time trying to cut those fire lines and do what they do we greatly appreciate the risk and then putting it on the line. So uh, these past few years have again been incredibly difficult for my district and my neighboring districts too, and many for rural forested regions of, of the West. Last year we saw over 10 million, acre, 10 million acres burn, over 40% of it in California alone. It's been just as difficult and it may even set greater records by the time 2021 is over with. More, even more communities were leveled this year, as I mentioned, than, than by last year, last two or three years. Six of the worst fire seasons on record have occurred over just a, a one-year period in 2020 and 2021. This includes the August complex, the SCU lightning fire, the creek, 
the North Complex fires in 2020, and including the devastating ones this year, Dixie, bootleg up in Oregon, Caldor south to me near uh, uh, the Tahoe area, the Monument fire to the west of my area, and many other tragedies ongoing. <clears throat> we know there are some 63 million acres at medium to high risk of wildfire, and at least 80 million acres of Forest Service land that need treatment. I was pleased to hear that um, uh, the chair's uh, mention of uh, previous Chief Christensen saying 20 million acres need to be done on a, a fast forward basis. <clears throat> Although the challenges for the Forest Service are many, the solutions that we must put into practice to prevent catastrophic wildfire are clear and well established. While many continue to blame a, claim, a changing climate for the increase in acres burned each year and the greater intensity of recent wildfires, the fact is most of our forests are indeed overgrown and overstocked for decades. We aren't doing enough management to reduce these fuel loads that have dramatically intensified the wildfire crisis. They're a national emergency, yet we will not solve this crisis without a fundamental shift on how we manage these lands. We need to increase the pace and scale of landscape projects that reduce hazardous fuel loads. We need to strategically thin the forests where necessary around uh, communities, of course, uh, defensible space around homes, and set up lines of defense, so maybe on our ridge tops or other areas that make sense, so when a fire does occur, and they will occur, that it gives our firefighters a place to make a stand instead of un unknown devastation for, for unknown distance. I find it very frustrating that um, some members of Congress and outside groups who don't represent national forests or areas constantly devastated by wildfire continue to try to put a stop to what Forest Service and other land managers are trying to do for with proactive management that will reduce the threat of wildfire and encourage healthy forest lands, healthy for the forests themselves, the wildlife, the water quality that uh, is going to be affected by so much ash and so much uh, uh, erosion of soil. Our forests, they're undergrown, excuse me, they're overgrown and undermanaged. We need to be doing more active management immediately to reduce the threat of these fires and save lives. I appreciate today we need to do, do more of these hearings on wildfire. And, I won't, and we won't solve the crisis by throwing money at the problem while needlessly at the same time hamstringing the Forest Service. So Chief Moore, again, thank you for being with us today. We're eager to hear your testimony, your ideas, and I look forward to work with you in identifying ways for Congress to do its part to support the Forest Service and the firefighters on the front line. We need to incentivize them to want to stay there. And so finally, to make great strides to address the wildfire crisis. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. LaMalfa. The, I would now like to recognize the ranking member, uh, ranking member Thompson, for any opening comments that he'd like to make at this time. Uh, Chairwoman, thank you so much for this hearing. Mr. Ranking Member, appreciate you both and your leadership in this area. And uh, certainly, once again, welcome to Chief Moore. I uh, much appreciate uh, you being here today and having this very timely conversation. Uh, while last year was one of the worst fire seasons on record, 2021 has been another incredibly challenging year for the Forest Service and the communities across the West. Uh, this year, we've seen roughly 5.8 million acres burned so far in some of the largest single fires, and we're still not even through the season. The fact of the matter is that our forests are overgrown and in need of more management and proactive treatment. This includes dramatically more hazardous fuels reduction, thinning, post-fire restoration, and landscape scale restoration projects to help reduce the intensity of wildfires. It also includes increasing timber harvest where it makes sense to support both the forest health and the rural economies. So we're still below the target level of harvest and not getting anywhere close to our allowable sales quantity system-wide. Uh, Chief Moore, I welcome your input uh, in this hearing and on how we can address these pressing issues. In my view, we need a fundamental shift in how we equip the Forest Service and forest managers to restore the land and do the work necessary to mitigate the wildfire crisis. Regarding reconciliation, the $40 billion for forestry, I'd like to echo the comments by Ranking Member LaMoffa. Uh, not only did this committee mark up the ag portion without the $28 billion for conservation, there are significant issues uh, with the forestry section that makes that funding unworkable. Uh, the forestry provisions don't just miss an opportunity to provide new authorities needed for more management. It actually, uh, it's worse uh, because it restricts the Forest Service's ability to do the res restoration necessary 
on the millions of acres at medium to high risk of wildfire. We can't just throw money at wildfire while limiting the service and hope, and hope for a different outcome. Continuing to put limited resources into a small scale projects will not restore our forests or reduce the threat of fire. We need to provide the appropriate level of funding coupled with workable authorities to help the agency increase management at the landscape scale. Uh, we tried doing this in the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, in 2018 with this committee's version of the Farm Bill, which contained a variety of authorities to help the Forest Service better manage and do so on a larger scale. And while the final bill does contain some limited new authorities, Senate Democrats once again refused to even meet with us to discuss the broader reforms necessary during the conference process. Wildfire is an emergency that we can wait no longer to address. Uh, Chief Moore, thank you uh, for, your, for your service and for your leadership, and, and again, for being here today and for this important discussion. We look forward to your testimony and thoughts on how we can support the rural economy, forest health, and efforts to reduce the threats of wildfire. In closing, I also uh, join the, uh, the chairwoman, ranking member, in recognizing our firefighters and, and uh, wildland responders. Uh, to, uh, we've, we've lost too many of them um, over the past number of years because of the size and the intensity of these, what I believe are avoidable wildfires if we're proactive with management. So to all of you who serve in those capacities, we say thank you for your support and constant sacrifices. We say thank you to your families who know that uh, they don't know if you're coming home at the end of the day. Uh, or the end of the week or the end of the month when they're, when they're dispatched and respond to these, these, these fires. Um, but we do appreciate your support and constant sacrifices to protect our, our forests, our homes, our property, and lives. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much, Ranking Member Thompson. The Chair would request that other members submit their opening statements for the record so our witness may begin his testimony and to ensure that there is ample time for our questions. I am pleased to welcome to the committee the Chief of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Forest Service, Mr. Randy Moore. Mr. Moore, Chief Moore, you will have five minutes to deliver your testimony. The timer should be visible to you on your screen and will count down to zero at which time your time has expired. Uh, Chief Moore, please begin whenever you are ready. Great. So Chair Spanberger, uh, Ranking Member LaMoffa, and Ranking Member Thompson, and members of this committee, it's my honor to testify today for the first time as Chief of the USDA Forest Service. I look forward to working closely with each of you. Today, I, I will focus on ongoing uh, wildfire crisis. I'll talk about what it will take to fight these fires, improve forest health, and also protect communities. By any other standard, we'd be gratified by our 98% success rate of putting fires out during initial attack. But when you see the tragic results left by just 2% of the fires, it's not good enough, not nearly. In my 40 plus career, a year career, 14 of those being in California, I've witnessed firsthand the devastation of these fires. It's like nothing I've seen before. The record fire year played out as forecasters predicted, climate change, drought, overgrowth and fuels created a dire condition that, that was just ripe for a severe outbreak. We spent a record number of days at preparedness level five, which is the highest fire risk level. More than 40,000 fires have ravaged 5.5 million acres of forest, consuming 4,000 homes, businesses, and outbuildings. Resources stretched thin, COVID-19 uh, infections spiked, four federal firefighters sacrificed their lives, and it's not over. The sober and takeaway, America's forests are in a state of emergency and it's time to treat them like one. This should be a call to action and it takes work on two fronts. We among others must maintain a stable firefighting force and a modern wildfire management system to ensure that we respond to these fires. But it's equally essential that we employ an active forest treatment program and strategy to put the work right away and do it in the right work, do the right work in the right places at the right scale to improve these forest conditions. First, we must ensure a stable, resilient firefighting force. That starts with taking care of our brave men and women who fight fires. They deserve better work, life balances, and benefits. 
They deserve a supportive workplace in return for the grueling hard work they do. In a time of increased stress, suicide, depression, they also need counseling and support services to prevent uh, the tragedies. They deserve better pay above all. Federal wages of firefighters have not kept pace with states. I've listened to stories of firefighters sleeping in their cars or neglecting their medical bills. We must work to improve pay and give them a livable wage. We already made a down payment on this commitment. As the president promised, we raised firefighters' base salary so no one makes less than $15 an hour. Permanent firefighters receive up to a 10% incentive. Temporary firefighters got a $1,000 award. But this is just a start. We're meeting and working with firefighters was listening to co-create permanent solutions. We must also modernize our wildland fire management system. This includes improving the use of technology. It also includes upgrading our models and systems for decision-making and strengthening our cooperative relationship. But we'll never hire enough firefighters. We'll never buy enough engines or aircraft to fight these fires. We must actively treat forests. That's what it takes to turn the situation around. We must shift from small scale treatments spread out in landscapes to strategic science-based treatments across boundaries at the size of the problem. It must start with those places most critically at risk. We must treat 20 million acres over 10 years. Done right in the right places, treatments make a difference. I saw firsthand the life-saving results of the Caldor fire in Lake Tahoe. Forest treatments became a first line of defense we're seeing more and more examples of success. Finally, we know we can't do this work alone. It'll take partners, industry, states, and federal agencies working together. I extend my thanks to Congress of what you're doing to pass the infrastructure bill. These investments are essential to getting this groundwork done. We're optimistic, we're working to get ready. In closing, we face this record year with both courage and humility. I'm grateful for every firefighter, cooperator, and support personnel. The best, the, the best way we can honor them, protect citizens, and reduce fire risk is to do this essential work on the ground. It's how we combat climate change. It's how we deliver services. It's how we create jobs and sustain the healthy, productive forests that Americans deserve. Thank you for this opportunity, and I'll be pleased to take any questions. Thank you so very much for your opening statement. Chief Moore, at this time, members will be recognized for questions in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members. You will be recognized for five minutes each in order to allow us to get to as many questions as possible. Please keep your microphones muted until you are recognized in order to minimize background noise. Um, I'll begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. And, and um, Chief Moore, I wanna thank you so very much for being here again. I congratulate you on you, your new position. Um, and I, I thank you for your opening testimony. You, and so I'll get right at my questions. You, you spoke about the recent pay raises, um, the announcement of the Biden administration regarding increased pay for firefighters, um, and, and spoke a little bit about that. Could you give us your assessment so far um, about whether or not you think that the increased pay for firefighters and what's been done so far will improve the agency's ability to hire and retain firefighters. Um, are there other long-term strategies that Congress can work on to address firefighter pay issues or retention issues? Yeah, so thank you, Chair uh, Spanberger. Um, so as Chief, one of the first things I wanna do is provide stability in the organization. And that means we have a lot of vacant positions. We also have uh, a lot of detailers in key leadership positions. And what that does is erodes the quality and the, and the continuity of decisions that need to be made on the ground. And so in order to provide some stability to address that critical issue within the agency, we need to get those positions filled and remove the detailers and put permanent uh, people in there. The other thing in terms of the focus that I think we need to do is what I mentioned in my opening statement, it's really thin in the forest to reduce fire risk. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about fire suppression, but really we need to spend an equal amount of time talking about the treatments out on the ground, because I think that that's gonna have an equal, it's more of a positive effect on how these fires are behaving as they walk, uh, walk across the, the landscape. 
And in, in terms of the question being uh, directly answered, I, I think it's a, it's a step in the right direction. Uh, mm -hmm. This is good news. Um, uh, you, you know, looking at um, fifteen dollars, uh, no one within the firefighting workforce work uh, make less than that. I think recognizing the firefighters up to the GS nine level uh, with a ten percent uh, award uh, based on their salary, mm -hmm. uh, th th those are a good steps to make. Um, but like I said earlier, that, that's it's a good beginning. I think we want to work with Congress uh, as well as the firefighters and the union themselves to look at how can we create co create. Uh, an opportunity to go that next step and, uh, in, in our firefighters. And Chief Moore, in, in your answer, you spoke about forest maintenance and thinning the forests. Um, and earlier this year, I introduced a piece of legislation called the Climate Stewardship Act alongside Senator Booker in the Senate. It laid out a framework for some climate smart federal investments in forestry and conservation. It also includes funding for a civilian climate corps. Separately, I worked with Congressman Neguse of Colorado uh, to introduce the, Clim the Civilian Climate Corps Act, uh, which is uh, counterparts, uh, Senators Coons, Heinrich, and Lujan have introduced in the Senate. Um, do you see and do you have any feedback for us as we look forward and continue to try and move these bills forward? Um, do you think that the creation of, or do you have any advice for us related to the creation of a, a civilian climate corps, how that might be helpful in building up the forestry workforce um, in that forest maintenance and in the preventative work that you just mentioned? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, so, so the Civilian Conservation Corps has, is a part of our proud history. In fact, a lot of the work that they have done back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s still stands today. There's a lot of skills that uh, are being developed within that workforce. In terms of a civilian climate corps, this will put a new uh, diverse generation of Americans to work that can help conserve and restore public lands and waters. And I think that the investment in restoration, reforestation, reclamation, and other activities that improve the function and form of our natural uh, systems will not only bolster our nation's resilience to extreme wildfires, sea level rise, drought, storms, and all the other climate impact, but they'll also create a new pathway to the forestry workforce of the future. Uh, thank you very, very much, um, Chief Moore, for that um, answer. I have 38 seconds left, so in the interest of respecting everyone's time, I'm actually going to yield back because I could otherwise spend another 10 minutes asking you many questions. Um, and I'm now going to yield to Ranking Member LaMalfa to answer his, answer, uh, ask his questions. Uh, thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Randy, let's talk about, I mean, Chief Moore, I mean, I know you as Randy, we can, anyway, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, Chief Moore, we, uh, let's talk about the initial attack on new fire starts, which, you know, we've seen some controversy about that uh, even even this, this year in California. Um, it's it's uh, extremely important that, in, I think, everybody's view that uh, an initial attack on a fire, while it's small, and containable, or more, at least theoretically containable, is uh, is preferable. So uh, when we talked about this some months ago, uh, you made a public pledge as well to uh, try and change what Forest Service uh, pattern is on that, or you know beef that up. So what what changes are are you putting into place, and would like to implement for Forest Service to aggressively put out new fires right right from the very beginning uh, at at the at the initial source. So thank you, Ranking Member LaMalfa. And as, as you well know, being in California, and particularly in the northern part of the state, uh, and, and as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, you know, when you really look at 45,000 fires that the fire service had to respond to uh, this fire year so far to date, and having a 98% success rate, initial attack has been very successful. The issue is really when those fires escape initial attack, uh, then they take on a behavior that we have not seen in our past, in our lifetimes. And so what we have to do, we have to talk also about forest treatments on the landscape because we'll never have enough firefighters to put every fire out as much as we would love to do that. We just simply won't have enough firefighters to do that. So we have to try and, and, and equalize or level the playing field and that is a very strong uh, and aggressive approach to forest management uh, because I believe that that has just as much of an impact, if not more, 
than the actual tactics and strategies we're deploying on these fire suppression efforts. I, I agree with that. That is indeed the, um, the only way we're going to be able to play defense on this is to have uh, the thinning and have uh, particular um, zones where you can trap fire as it, as it approaches it in a, in a situation like that. But, uh, you know, there's, there's always much concern out in the field. My office gets many of the calls that, said, you know, where they say it seems like they're monitoring the fire. It seems like they're not attacking it initially. We, we saw that, I think, on the Tamarack there, that uh, it was an area that was observed for, oh, I think Mr. McClintock could tell us, but uh, probably about over a week. And then it was felt like it was an, an area that wouldn't do much, but then a wind came along and conditions happened and it turned into a very large fire. So you, you'll continue to pursue a, a strong initial attack. Would you say that the service will throw all the resources they can at initially keeping fires small? Uh, Congressman, we're doing that right now, and I appreciate you bringing it up the Tamarack fire because, you know, it's so easy for um, someone to look in hindsight at what we're doing and second-guess the decision. But let me tell you what actually happened on the Tamarack fire uh, since you brought that up. Uh, it was a single tree fire is how it started. At the time, we had 100 large wildfires. We had 27,000 firefighters deployed on fighting their fires. So we didn't have a lot of additional firefighters to put on every fire uh, trying to put it out. We took the appropriate uh, response. We uh, spiked out uh, 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 some, a, a small crew to monitor that fire. The problem with that fire is, is, is the same problem that we have all across the West, that once that fire broke away from that initial area, it just exploded into a larger fire. But, um, it, it, you know, looking at the priorities and where we spend our firefighters, it's really about protecting life and property first. Our firefighter was deployed uh, to protect communities, life and property. And that fire was in a remote area. And so the, best, the only choice we really had was to monitor that fire. And as soon as that fire broke, uh, it was um, a matter of just uh, reassigning crews to try and attack those larger fires because all of a sudden, uh, it was threatening uh, communities. And so we would have loved to have been able to have enough crews uh, to put on that fire. And here again, you know, just that example, it lends itself to having the wrong discussion about what we really should be uh, talking about. And that is a very active uh, forest management program um, because there will always be situations where you can second guess the decisions that were made. And, and I can't defend any decision because in your community, if your community is threatened, uh, then that's what matters. The yeah. problem, though, is that there's a lot of communities that are threatened, and we're having to make some tough choices. Yeah, I, I get that. It is staffing. It is spread out of resources. It's just the Dixie Fire, for example, started because of one tree falling into a power line. And on the Tamarack situation, it's not uncommon like a fire that happened in Grass Valley just a month ago that... Uh, they pulled resources off another one in order to pounce on that, and they kept it to within you know a couple hundred acres right in the middle of a town, and then they put the resources back on a much larger ongoing fire. So I'm not here to second guess you, sir. It's just more of an issue of uh, uh, when when we have an opportunity to, and, and you, you said the 98 percent, that, that's pretty incredible, but it only takes one to turn into a million acres like we have with the Dixie fire. And Anyway, uh, I need to yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Ranking Member LaMalfa, um, and certainly I'm always happy to let you go a little over time when we're talking wildfires, because I know how impacted your district is. Uh, the chair will now recognize Congresswoman Pingree of Maine. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, um, and thank you so much uh, for, for holding this important hearing today, and uh, welcome, Chief Moore. Um, I'm really looking forward to working with you, and I'm very pleased to see you in that position, I really appreciate the fact that you bring so many years of experience and understanding into this job, and I, I'm sure we'll be well served by working with you. I also uh, appreciate your opening statement and the emphasis you've placed on making sure that the employees of the Forest Service are well treated, well paid, and understanding how critical that is to achieving your mission. So I could ask you probably a million questions today, but I'm going to try to just get a couple of them out. Um, and I uh, just want to, you know, uh, 
say my condolences for those communities that have, have been so dramatically affected by the fires, by the firefighters that fight them, and the huge challenges that are faced out west by uh, districts like Mr. Lamalfus. Um, as you know, I come from Maine, where the most forested state in the nation, but a very different set of circumstances. And I, I know um, you know um, what our forests are like and some of our challenges. One of the things that I wanted to bring up which is somewhat of a side issue, I guess, but I think it's critical, is that one of the obstacles, as I see it, to wildfire risk reduction is the lack of markets for small diameter wood, which means it's generally not cost effective to remove it. And we have to understand that forests have to be you know, healthy in the marketplace as well. But innovative wood products like cross laminated timber have the potential to derive um, demand for this material, reduce the wildfire hazards, and even reduce the carbon footprint of new construction, which I think is an important thing to remember. Uh, in the Build Back Better Act, we put a billion dollars in there to wood innovation grants, but it's also been something that I've been anxious to increase the funding for. Could you just talk a little bit about the important role that the Forest Service plays in wood innovation and helping us to develop these new markets? Because I just see that as critical. Thank you, Congresswoman Pingree, and, and you're absolutely right. Uh, we need to be looking at uh, new markets. Um, so, so the Forest Service, uh, along with our partners, have been working to expand markets for innovative wood products and renewable energy for a while now. And some of the specific examples uh, of available programs in the Forest Service include uh, wood innovation uh, program, uh, community wood um, uh, grant programs, and, and this includes potential to use wood for advanced biofuel, biofuel biochar, heat, uh, and power. And through our research and development deputy area, the Forest Service is also partnering with other uh, government agencies, small businesses, uh, tribal communities, and industry uh, collaborators, and universities that are actually across the, the world to produce high uh, quality science-based forest product innovation. And so our forest product research you know, in, in many cases, it is stimulating uh, economic resilience in many areas, including housing, uh, bioenergy, tourism, packaging, and paper. And by promoting the efficient use of forest products, our research also helps protect against natural disturbance. We talk about wildfires, but it's also about invasive species and a climate change, uh, uh, you know, a change in climate or climate change that's creating a lot of these situations out there. We have other uh, wood markets that we're very proud of as well, the, um, the CLT uh, industry. In fact, uh, I was scheduled to go and look at the uh, first uh, Forest Service building from the Nest Hearst, uh, who was built using CLT uh, products. So we do think that this is an opportunity to use more of that, you know, the small logs that we have in clearing the, the national forest and just that whole forested landscape. And I really appreciate you bringing this up because new markets need to emerge. And the Forest Service, uh, through our research and development branch, is very active in trying to help create and stimulate the economy around some of these new markets. Well, thank you. And I, I look forward to being able to chat with you more about some of the things that you're seeing um, and that they're doing um, at the Wood Products Lab. Uh, I, I'm going to run out of time for you to answer this question, but I just want to put it out there and, and perhaps uh, we can follow up with a conversation about this at other time. But you've uh, emphasized the importance of this very active forest management program. And I'm really interested to see how the Forest Service is looking at this into the future, because um, I think there are so many complexities involved with increasing the harvest, understanding, um, you know, old growth forest and what's important to keep for our climate change, uh, you know, impacts of carbon sequestration, the impact of these new markets, um, understanding, you know, the role of a uh, rebuilding our forests, the challenges with clear cutting and the, some of the things we know now about how forests naturally rebuild. Um, you know, it's way too many things in one sort of pocket, but I, I know that um, this is really an important part of the Forest Service vision about how we manage into the future. I've got nine seconds, so maybe you can only just say, yeah, we could talk about that or anything you want to say. Yes, Congresswoman, I would love to talk to you uh, to a large extent about this. I have some ideas I'd love to share, so look forward to the opportunity. Great. Thank you. I'll look forward to that, too. And again, thank you for, for taking on this role and uh, we're here to support you. The chair will now recognize Mr. Allen from Georgia for five minutes. Mr. Allen, you are muted, sir. All right. Uh, I've got two hearings going, so sorry. <laughs> Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, thank you for having this hearing today. I think it's very important that we talk about this uh, issue and and, re and really get to the the, the, the true truth of the matter. Um, you know, wildfires, particularly those on federal lands, are a major safety, public health, and environmental issue for our western states. I was at a meeting out in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, the, over the uh, August uh, work period, and uh, I couldn't believe it. I mean, uh, the smoke, uh, you couldn't even see the Grand Teton Mountains for the amount of smoke in Wyoming that was coming from the wildfires in uh, Oregon and California. Uh, over 70% of the nationwide acreage burned by wildfires in 2020 was on federal lands. I mean, shouldn't that tell us something? Uh, so, uh, Chief Moore, I'm glad to have you here today to, uh, on behalf of the USDA Forest Service to, to try to help uh, us understand uh, what the real problem is. Uh, there are several schools of thought on why you know, we're dealing more with wildfires today than ever before, but uh, uh, I believe the elephant in the room is just simply management and, and uh, just uh, uh, good uh, care of uh, this which uh, has been given to us and we have dominion over. Uh, federal regulations which prevent the active management of our nation's forests uh, and, and protect spe uh, specific species of animals to the detriment of the rest of the world due to increased carbon emissions via wildfire. Those are the two biggest enemies which proponents of carbon sequ sequestration will find. Uh, these environmental groups who clog our courts with frivol frivolous lawsuits to stop the active management of our forests are another enemy of carbon se sequestration. And we must work to modernize our environment, environmental regulations to have a more fulsome understanding of environmental health as a concept. Most concerning for all of the climate control proponents out there in recent years is the carbon emissions from the California wildfires. I mean, why aren't we talking about that? Uh, in fact, uh, the carbon emissions of the California wildfires is greater than the amount of carbon emissions that are produced in a year to provide power to the entire state of California. The Forest Service itself estimates that publicly and privately owned forests are offsetting roughly 14% of all U.S. carbon emissions. And in fact, we need those forests to be healthy to provide the uh, ability to deal with uh, a uh, and, and to provide oxygen and use the carbon uh, that they need to survive. Uh, I hope we can work together to modernize our federal regulatory system in a way that will allow us to manage our federal lands and uh, do this more effectively. Uh, Chief, what do you see the uh, main reason for the increase in our uh, wildfires that we've seen in recent years? So, uh, Congressman, thank you for that question. And it, it has a lot of different tentacles. And so I'm just going to choose to go down a couple of them just for the sake of time. Uh, you know, we, we made decisions back in the early 1900s to put all fires out immediately. And while that was the right decision at the time, over time, we have found out that that may not be the right decision because the consequences is that now we have an overstocked dense forest. And then when you lay climate change on top of that, once a fire gets started in those conditions, they're creating a catastrophic events like we have never seen before. And so now it has caused us to focus on fire suppression alone, but we really have to talk about treating the forest to remove some of that overstocked dense material because it's lending itself to the fire behavior that we're seeing on the landscape. But it's, it's, it's obvious uh, when you look at uh, compared to uh, our private lands that are uh, actively managed. Uh, you're not, you're not going to have time to, to cover this, but um, we talk about uh, climate change and how that is uh, causing forest fires. Um, if you have uh, data available, uh, in, if you, like I said, it's, it's, it, I'm about out of time, but if you get that to my office, uh, so that I could review that, the, the science of how climate change causes forest fires and uh, has created this increase in forest fires, I would, I would certainly appreciate it. And with that, uh, 
uh, Madam Chairman, I, uh, I yield back. I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Mr. Allen. And Mr. O'Halloran from Arizona is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member. I, um, I'd like to thank all the firefighters on the line who have done so much to keep communities across the West safe this summer. The tireless work of those on the line at the Telegraph and Raphael fires in my district saved communities in Arizona, and I want to express my gratitude to them. However, I would be remiss if I did not mention the other important lesson from these fires. Areas that were previously treated or burned were, are less susceptible to severe fire. But more, more significant is the, uh, they, they become susceptible to flooding into nearby communities and streams. That brings me to the Forest Service's decision to cancel phase two contract for the Forest, for, for, Forest Restoration Initiative, for Fry. I'm deeply disappointed that after 11 amendments and nearly two years, there is no clear indication when there are going to be, we, when we are going to get phase two off the ground. Chief Moore, I thank you for uh, your willingness to quickly engage in, on Forfry in the conversation we had last week with some of your deputy chiefs. I'm hopeful that the administration is now engaged in the issue and I expect our offices will stay in close contact over the coming weeks to ensure that this gets done quickly. Uh, we also need to remember that uh, while the Forest Service has seen decades of, of diminishing uh, amount of personnel dedicated to management of the forest. Uh, I've seen this ongoing now for 21 years of my life in public service, uh, both in the legislature in Arizona and uh, in Congress. Thankfully, in the last two years, because of members on this committee, uh, we were able to get some changes done and hopefully we'll continue to move in the right direction. Uh, but um, uh, I think it's really we have to make sure the public fully understands this is not a 10-year commitment. This can't be a 20-year commitment. This has to be a commitment that we keep both our communities protected during times of fire, but make sure we don't allow fires to get into the catastrophic conditions that they have been in at one time in Arizona. Wally Covington, a forest expert, world-renowned actually, Wally said, uh, a fire in Arizona at 25,000 acres would be a big fire. Now we almost pray for a 25,000 acre fire. Um, so with that, Chief, I, I, I'd like to ask you and, and thank you again, uh, what is the timeline for issuing a new RFP for Four Fry? Thank you, uh, Congressman Halloran. You know, I, I understand that many Arizonans and the Arizona businesses were really counting on the award of this large scale uh, four five project. And I understand how disappointed they they are over it as well. I, I need you to know that I'm disappointed too. You know, I've talked with the regional foresters and, and I've also talked with the evaluation panel and I understand the decision that they made. Uh, and I think it was the right decision considering what the potential outcomes could have been. I do want you to know, though, that I am committed to getting this proposal back out uh, very soon and certainly in a much, much quicker fashion than we did the first time around. So I will um, I will pay personal attention to getting that out ASAP. And I would say that uh, we'll be following up with you so that you, as well as uh, all Arizonans, know the status uh, of, the, of the project, of the proposal. I want to thank you for that, Chief Moore. How, how are you going to be working with the stakeholders in the Four Fry stakeholder group to show that the Forest Service is committed to the success of Four Fry and to rebuild trust. Uh, the, the, as a group, uh, we started in the mid, uh, well, the middle of the last two decades ago now, uh, to start Four Fry uh, with the help of the Forest Service and uh, environmentalists and ranchers and farmers and, and every uh, one of the stakeholders out there. It moved along over the course of a couple of years and then it hit a, a brick wall. How are we going to make sure that we're not going to hit that brick wall again and that the stakeholders are going to have input into the process? You know, Congressman, I, uh, you know, through disappointment, trust is what erodes. And, you know, 
our word may not be as important or as valuable as our actions. And so I'm uh, willing to uh, demonstrate through action that the Forest Service is trustworthy. Uh, and we're gonna do that by uh, demonstrating that we can get this project done, but we're also gonna engage the community uh, in this project so that it becomes ours, not, not mine, if, if, if that makes sense. So we, we want to do this collaboratively uh, to the extent that we can, and we're committed to that. Thank and you, Chief, and uh, I have to yield now. It's my time's up, thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Moore for five minutes from Alabama. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Chief Moore. I appreciate you being here today. We, you know, in Alabama, we have a pretty good reputation of managing our forest, and actually my district director has a forestry background, so we, quite familiar with the process. I, I did have a question and uh, I guess it's as good as any now. Now so more than ever, I believe this committee agrees that expedited forest management is needed. In your opinion, what policy changes would free up the good folks on the ground to be able to act quickly and effectively to manage and reduce our fuel loads? Well, Congressman Moore, thank you uh, for that question. It's, it's one that uh, I, I, you know, I have to say that I think the legislation that's being considered now uh, would be one of the things that could help us greatly. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to do just what we're talking about, and that is to increase our ability to go out on this landscape and do the necessary work that needs to be done. One thing that I, you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about what happens in the West, but I got to tell you, if the West could mimic what's happening in the South, that would be our end game. Whereas in the South, when it comes to fire, we've done a lot of maintenance burns, uh, prescribed burning, uh, that's the ideal situation. And when you look at the number of acres treated across the whole U.S., and you look at us treating 3 million acres uh, as an agency, over a million and a half of that comes from the southern region, region eight. And it's because they have the conditions there. They also have the culture uh, that accepts um, prescribed burning in a much bigger way than what we do out west. And so I, I would say that uh, um, I'm hopeful based on some of the legislations that you all are considering uh, in Congress. And I think that that's gonna give us our best opportunity that we've had in, in quite some time. Thank you, Chief. Actually, that's my experience. I met with forestry in Alabama a few weeks ago, and that was one of the things that they talked about was just the control management process, the burns, whatever, whatever we have to do to keep those fuel loads down. And I, I hope that, others will follow our lead in that respect and maybe we can get some of these things under control but uh, with that madam chairman thank you so much i appreciate your time thank you chief i appreciate you attending and being here as a, a witness today thank you very much the chair now recognizes mr panetta from california for five minutes outstanding thank you uh madam chair and of course uh chief moore uh outstanding to have you here uh, absolutely thrilled uh, when I found out that you were selected to be the next chief of the U.S. Forest Service. So uh, congratulations, but also thank you. Let me express my appreciation for all of your help and for all of your work uh, as regional forester for the Pacific Southwest region. Uh, I tell you, based on our conversations, based on our work together, I really couldn't think of a better person to lead the Forest Service. And what I believe, and I think what we all know, really is uh, an unfortunately more dangerous era of wildfire years rather than wildfire seasons is what we're facing. Um, now, obviously, you've been instrumental in the creation and the formulation of my legislation. I want to thank you as well uh, in my legislation, the Replant Act, the Wildfire Emergency Act, and the Save Our Forests Act. And I look forward to continuing to talk with you as we continue to push this legislation forward through our process here uh, but also uh, to ensure that we can implement our shared vision of a safer, healthier, and more sustainable forest uh, across our country. Now, I, we've had a couple conversations, and I spoke with your, your predecessor, Chief Christensen, on a number of occasions about chronic staffing shortages in the Forest Service. And as you know, look, 80% of wildfires in the U.S., at least on based on my numbers, you may have different numbers, but my numbers are 80% are caused by humans and, and being in, in the urban or the wildfire urban interface, basically the fastest growing land use type in this country that I'm sure you're familiar with. At the same time, as you know, the Forest Service suffers from chronic staffing shortages, 
with several national forests, including the Los Padres National Forest in my district on the central coast of California, suffering from insufficient law enforcement and recreation management staff. And that's why I introduced the Save Our Forests Act. And so I wanted to get your take on what it would be like if we just had one additional recreation management position in each ranger district in the wildland urban interface How would that translate, if at all, into reducing the incidence of wildfire and improving the long-term health of our forests? Thank you, Congressman Panetta. And um, to respond to the first part of the question, I'm actually humbled to have this opportunity to serve as chief. You you know, uh, I I think you bring it up something that's really important to us as an agency. You know, if I go back 20 years ago, uh, we have lost 38% of our non-fire workforce. That 38% represents some of those resource areas that you're talking about. It's recreation, land, special uses, forestry, soil and water, you know, all of those skills, archeologists, wildlife biologists. So so we've we've had a lot of vacant positions because of, as the fire has continued to increase and we've had to be more responsive from a budget standpoint to those fires, we have not had the ability to maintain the staff that we've lost. Now we've done really well because we've looked at technology, we've improved efficiencies, and we have done a really good job. You know, look at the outputs that they're similar to what they have been. But what happened is that we have an overworked workforce. We have a workforce that's tired. They can't continue to work at this pace and scale. We need to fill many of those positions that we've lost over time um, due to this situation that uh, we're talking about today. So it would be very helpful. Understood. Understood. I appreciate that. I appreciate you hitting on the prescribed burns. Thank you very much. It's exactly what uh, uh, my legislation, the Wildfire Emergency Act, hits on and expands, and at least in regards to permitting for that prescribed burns. Um, I understand your sentiment about the West mimicking the South. Obviously, we got a little bit more hurdles out in the West, as you know well, uh, for a number of reasons. But hopefully, this legislation allows us to get over those hurdles so that we can have more prescribed burns uh, in our forest in order to reduce. Uh, the chances of wildfire. Moving on, in regards to reforestation, quickly, I got less than a minute. Would lifting the cap on the reforestation trust fund as outlined in my replan act, would that help the Forest Service address the backlog of reforestation projects that we got? Uh, In short answer is yes, it would. Right now, we're limited by $30 million. We have um, 1.3 million acres that need reforestation. We're only able to do about 60,000 acres at best with what's funded now. So as we, and that doesn't even include the fires from the Dixie and, and this whole, this year's fires. So being able to do that and develop public private partnerships and helping us do some reforestation efforts would be a great way to go. So if that cap was removed, it gives us more flexibility to do those, these types of things. Outstanding, look forward to working with you, continuing to work with you. And thank you again for your service and not just fire suppression, but fire prevention. Thank you, Chief. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Chair now recognizes the Ranking Member of the full committee, Ranking Member, ranking member Thompson. Chair Wong, thank you so much. Chief Moore, thank you again. Uh, my first question, Chief, um, the, you know, the Forest Service needs to get closer to or above, preferably, its national timber targets for the coming year. Uh, how much timber do you foresee the agency harvesting in 2021 and 2022? So we, uh, you know, go back two years and we had a, a goal of about 4 million uh, board feet, uh, uh, 4 billion board feet that we we're planning to, uh, to, to accomplish this past year. Um, but we're probably going to come in at about 60% of that. Uh, part of it is the situation that we've been talking about all morning that we've had a number of fires that have burned through planned uh, timber sales, planned uh, restoration work. And so we've lost the ability to do that. The other thing is that since we've had so many fires uh, this year, we've had to take a lot of members that support fire in a support role uh, to support uh, the whole fire suppression efforts that we've had this year. So those are resources that we're not going to do on this, this, uh, this other work that you're talking about. So, so different reasons, uh, we're not able to uh, accomplish that. I, might I also say at this point though, that I, I, I think if we can get to a point where we talk about what the land needs, uh, I think we will find that we're doing a lot more than what we had planned to do. And, and I think the outcomes would be uh, greater uh, than what we're planning to do because it puts the focus 
on the wrong part of the conversation. And we need to have a broader conversation about landscape work, landscape improvements, and all of the product that comes off of landscape uh, treatment. Very good. Well, thank you for that. Now, the 2018 Farm Bill provided the Forest Service with various authorities intended to help the agency to conduct better management. This includes reauthorization of the insect and disease, categorical exclusion, as well as categorical exclusion for the greater sage grouse and mule deer habitat. Has the agency issued guidance or gone through the rulemaking process to implement these authorities? And if so, has the agency utilized these authorities? And, and if not, why? Yeah, thank you, uh, ranking member. I, the answer is yes, uh, we utilize these greatly. Uh, take a look at the Good Neighbor Authority. Uh, we continue to grow relationships with state and other partners in the GNA. And, and this has really allowed us to restore a lot of watersheds and managed forests on national forests uh, uh, you know, via agreements or contracts. What you might also want to know is that we have a total of about 286 GNA agreements across the U.S. and they cover a variety of restoration activities that are in place in 38 different states. And so we've been using the, uh, the tools that Congress has allowed us to have. I think uh, when I look at timber harvesting for a moment, uh, timber harvesting on the GNA, it continues to grow. We had well over 230 million board feet that were sold in 2020 under this authority. And this is an increase of about 182 million board feet from the year before. So we are seeing a continued growth in these areas using some of these um, types of tools. The other thing that I'm really proud of is the CLRP, the collaborative. Uh, we're actually implementing now the reauthorized CL, uh, CFLRP program per congressional direction. Uh, in the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, that has been a that has been a success because we have had the opportunity to bring the community of people into deciding what needs to happen on that landscape, and then everyone is throwing in their money, so to speak, to make these things happen. These tools are allowing us to operate in a much more collaborative uh, fashion. And the last thing that I'll respond to is that the implementation of the Healthy Forest Restoration Act. Uh, all of the regions across the U.S. are really uh, developing projects using the insect and disease portion of that and the wildfire resilience CEs that was contained in the HFRA. Uh, and so we're, we're really pleased uh, for the tools that Congress has provided us. And I do want you to know that we're utilizing those to the full extent. And we think that the opportunity uh, continues to grow uh, with these tools. Thanks, you, Chief. I'm obviously I'm a, a huge supporter of the Forest Service research that's done from many perspectives. The things that we're looking at um, and the research on where specifically the agency needs to perform rest, restoration activities to reduce the threat of wildfire. Um, you know, I, I mean, how uh, and we can talk about this offline. I, I'll just tee up the question. Looking forward to talking with you. How the Forest Service intends to use this research and to be able to pri prioritize those types of projects. And uh, with that, Madam Chair, I am just about out of time, so I yield back. Thank you very much, Ranking Member Thompson. The Chair now recognizes Congresswoman Schreier from Washington State. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome, Chief Moore. I'm delighted to meet you and look forward to working closely with you to keep our forests healthy and our communities safe from wildfire. There have been some very recurrent themes today. And um, so I, I hope you will have some really good um, opportunities for a path forward after, after this discussion. Um, as I'm sure you know, uh, the wildfire outlook in my home state of Washington and across the whole Pacific Northwest is getting more dire. Uh, every year we're seeing more fires, earlier fires, a longer fire season, and more money and resources used to suppress those fires. And um, so I wanted to focus on ways to make our forests healthier, which most of us are, are talking about today, to make them more resilient to wildfire and sort of the nitty gritty of what we'll need uh, to get there. A recent report from the Washington Department of National Resources identified 3 million acres of forest lands um, just in our state alone in, in need of reforestation. Significant percentage of those acres are in my district in rural central Washington, including about 700,000 acres in the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest. And the towns here are some of the most at risk uh, locations for wildfire in the nation. 
Uh, our state is doing some incredible work. Washington State Department of Natural, Res of Natural Resources, local fire districts, counties, nonprofits, private forests are doing this kind of work and they're conducting the controlled burns and the mechanical thinning that we've all talked about today as much as possible. But they face some really big barriers and one of those barriers is the need to partner with the Forest Service. And in places like Chelan County, 70% of the land is owned by the Forest Service. And so no matter how good a job our state does and private forest holders do, 70% uh, is, on, is on you. Um, and to that end, my colleagues and I are working to bolster the Forest Service resources. We got, we've got the National Prescribed Fire Act uh, that increases federal investment with uh, member LaMalfa. We've got the National Forest Restoration Remediation Act to allow the Forest Service to get interest money. Um, and then we have the bipartisan infrastructure bill that puts more money in for forest health. Um, I understand that you and George Geisler, Washington State Forester, go way back. And I would just love to encourage you to continue to work uh, with George and with our Commissioner of Public Lands, Hillary Franz, and the local fire departments to increase the pace and scale of uh, fuel reduction. Um, they are ready, they are willing, they're excited to work with you, and they just want that relationship uh, to work to work better. And if you could, you know, deal kind of with the details. I know one of those details we've talked about is how do we get more personnel? How can you hire more people? Because you do need people to do this work. And we've talked about, I think many of us were surprised that um, firefighters were not um, making $15 an hour. That still seems incredibly low. Local fire departments pay more. And so of course you were losing people. How can you address this issue of staffing uh, and funding? Do you have specific plans to ramp up the number of people you have? So, so thank you, Congressman Schreier. I, I really appreciate that question. Uh, you know, I, I talked about a 38% reduction uh, in our resource-related programs uh, from 20 years ago. And so if we have to replace those positions, our funded needs to reflect that. So I'm hopeful uh, based on some of the legislation that's currently in Congress. Uh, and I think that if that does happen, it gives us our best chance that we've had in a long time to fill some of those necessary vacant positions. George and I talk often, George guys, the state forester there, and we do go back a long ways. And we do have some opportunities uh, to do a lot more than what we're currently doing. You know, what I'm pleased about is the uh, state uh, share stewardship agreements that we've been signing with the governors. I think we have about 46 of those now. That coupled with the GNA authorities gives us the uh, opportunity to work across jurisdictional boundaries and landscapes. And so now I think we have some authorities that will allow us to do that, but we need our budgets uh, increase somewhat to hire some of those really needed positions uh, to spend the time uh, developing those agreements and to spend the time going out on the ground and working with that local community and engage in them and how we should go about and making those improvements that protect they them. Are, they are ready to dive in and get to work. And so whatever barriers are there, if you could work to uh, to, to eliminate those, uh, I think we could make even more progress um, just relying on state, local, even private um, and, and ranger workforces. So thank you. I understand we'll have a second round and I'll get to more questions then. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Johnson from South Dakota. Um, and because we are making excellent time and there's interest in doing a second round, just to let all of the members know who may be interested, we will do a second round of questions. And thank you for your willingness to stick with us, Chief Moore. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, thanks, Chief Moore. It is great to have you. Uh, the Black Hills National Forest is one of the only forests that had had a regular monthly meeting as part of an advisory board. And as you would expect, the advisory board had representatives from all kinds of user groups, uh, timber folks, uh, state and local governments, the Norbeck Society, trails, uh, permittees, et cetera. And so way back in June of 2020, the coordinator for this local forest advisory board submitted their charter renewal, uh, a list of new members, everything that was needed. And this was six months prior to uh, the deadline for doing so. Now, since that time, again, June of 2020, there has been no action taken. 
uh, in DC. And so the uh, Forest Advisory Board hasn't been authorized to meet either virtually or in person for the entire year. And of course, this is at a time when there are a lot of very big issues going on with the Black Hills National Forest, a time when you would think input from this broad uh, group of stakeholders would be valuable to the Forest Service and to the forest. And, and, and during that time, our office has re reached out a number of times to Forest Service liaisons, and it just seems like we can't get any real communication, we can't get any movement. Uh, by the regional or national office to renew this forest advisory board. And so I guess my, my question, Chief Moore, is just, I mean, can we get uh, some sort of a commitment from you uh, to work with us on getting this advisory board reauthorized? Uh, Congressman Johnson, thank you for that, that question. And this is one that I've actually been personally briefed on. And, uh, and, and after the brief, I agree that the board improved uh, collaborative opportunities and relationship with individuals. And, and, and you know, it hasn't happened yet. But I'm, I'm pleased to report to you that the package is in the final stages of the clearing process as we speak. So I would look for that to happen fairly soon. Um, but I agree with you wholeheartedly uh, on what has occurred over time. Chief, fairly soon, just kind of give me a ballpark to set expectations. Are we talking days, uh, weeks, months? Well, I don't, I don't think it's uh, certainly not months, but, you know, um, we've done everything that we need to do as an agency. So I, I think the clearing process now it has to take place um, over in the department. Okay. And I, I know that they are working on that really hard. And while I can't give you a specific time, I can tell you that it's in the final stages of uh, being cleared. Thanks, Chief. Uh, you know, Madam Chair, I would just note this is an important part of our oversight responsibility. That's why I want to thank you for this hearing. Deadlines drive achievement, and, and I think Chief Moore clearly came prepared today and was ready to address a lot of our questions. And so these hearings do make a difference in how the agencies respond to our needs. Uh, Chief, uh, another one. As you uh, certainly know, in the Black Hills, our local volunteer fire departments, they volunteered uh, for the initial attack of these forest fires and, and grassland fires. And I think one of the frustrations they've shared with me is this 24-hour rule. So they can be on site with the initial attack. They're getting close to the end of the 24-hour period. They feel like they're on the cusp of having the fire contained. They're pulled off the fire, even though uh, sufficient Forest Service resources are not yet in place for a seamless handoff to close this fire out. And so I just wanted some insight from you. You know, what's the, the statutory uh, or regulatory, uh, uh, why is this 24 hour rule in place? Where does it come from? And is there any flexibility so we can uh, do a better job of closing these fires out? Yeah, thank you, Congressman. Yeah, so that usually comes through our mutual aid response, uh, these fires. And, and I think, you know, as we look at uh, updating uh, the agreements, these are the types of things that I think we need to be documenting so that when we have the opportunity to uh, update the mutual aid uh, in response, that we allow flexibility geographically. You know, one of, one of our biggest challenges is that, and for good reason, you know, we go out with direction uh, that's national in scope and what that does uh, sometimes is it doesn't allow flexibility for that local geographic area. And so we want to find the, really the sweet spot in these agreements to allow flexibility at that local level um, as long as it meets the national intent. And so we're, we're going to be working toward that ideal and I, hopefully uh, we'll be able to respond to these same issues that you're talking about through the mutual aid uh, agreement. But it doesn't just happen there in South Dakota. This is a common problem in many of uh, other locations. And, and I think that uh, we're making notes from this hearing that these are some of the things that we think we need to uh, take on to improve the fire service and how we respond as a collective group. And because I tell you, the volunteer fire department, local fire departments, we couldn't do this without them. And so if there's challenges, we need to deal with those directly. Chief, I've got a third question, which I don't have time to ask, and so I'll submit it uh, for the record and, and uh, look forward to getting a response from your team. It deals with the four forest uh, restoration initiative and to what extent that uh, effort can be expanded into the Black Hills National Forest and elsewhere. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Moore, for your very detailed questions. And I now recognize uh, Congressman Costa from California. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
person for allowing me to uh, sit in on the subcommittee here. Uh, you and I have had a number of conversations about the importance of the role your subcommittee plays, and the invitation to have you come out to California still stands uh, as we deal with these challenging issues affecting uh, America's forest. Chief, we're excited uh, about your participation and your career. Uh, it's been long established. By the way, I like that backdrop. Is that Mount Shasta, or, <laughs> or where might you be there? Yeah, uh, Mount Shasta uh, is, okay. is uh, part of God's country in California. We want to keep it that way. But we've had horrific fires. Let us stipulate for the fact that I think everyone is aware of that uh, we are in a crisis mode as it relates to the conditions of American forest caused by not only climate change but a multitude of factors. Would you agree? Uh, yes, I would. And we no longer have a fire season, certainly in California and the West, but we have a fire year, it seems, right? Right. Are, are you satisfied with the status quo, Chief? Congressman, you, I, I say you know me well and to know that I'm not. Uh, I don't Good. think anyone. Um, when's the last time we've updated the uh, U.S. Forest Service uh, land management plan? So they, they generally run anywhere around uh, uh, 10 to 15 years, more likely 15 years. And so that's not century, adequate, do you believe? Well, it would be if they were a living uh, document where we make changes. But they're not. No, 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 no. Well, not completely. Some are, uh, but, but generally. Would you agree that it's time that we really take the effort to update the forest management plans for all of these forests that are being impacted, not only in the West, but wherever else is, it's appropriate? Yes, and we're in the process, Congressman, of about 100 updates, 100 forest And how updates. much would that cost to update the forest management plans? Well, I, I don't have a, a number yet on how much that would cost. Well, we need to know that so we provide you with the resources. And then once the plans are updated uh, for the forests throughout the country, then we, you need to have the money to implement the plan. We were in a I was in a hearing uh, a year ago, and they estimated that to truly do the work to, uh, over a period of time that is necessary to provide proper forest management, we're talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 billion a year for a period of at least six to eight years. Could you check those sure. numbers and verify and get back to the members of the committee? Because as we look at the uh, reconciliation effort, as we look at the uh, budget year coming up, uh, I think we need to, the, the, the crisis mode that we're in, we need to address this issue. Would you not agree? Yes, I was certainly looking to uh, those numbers, Congressman. And, and if we have those numbers, I think we're in a better position to provide you all the forest management tools you need so that we can address the challenges that we face of proper managing our forests. I mean, the, the, when you look at the monies that we're pay, paying each year for fire suppression, uh, frankly, uh, we, we spend all the money that we set aside for forest management, and, and we end up in the billions of dollars uh, spending money for fire suppression. And, and frankly, if we continue in this vein, I, I don't think we're ever going to uh, deal with the crisis or provide uh, the forest the proper management they deserve. Would you agree? Uh, yes, I would agree with the majority of that, sir. So we need a plan, up. we need updated plans, and then we need the financial resources to give you all the, uh, the tools in the management toolbox to do the work that, that provides the certainty that forests in the future, uh, with all the factors we're dealing with that include climate change, will, will be there for the next generations of American come for all the multiple uses that they serve. I mean, is that not the goal? Absolutely, one of the goals. Let me ask you a little bit about, uh, with all the horrific fires we've had in California and the West, the partnerships between state and federal. You've been in California for a, a good time. Uh, Cal Fire and our, 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 I know about, and I know about our, our California response and our efforts over the last several years. How would you describe the partnership between the Forest Service and, and, and states like California and the necessity of continuing to improve and work on them? Well, uh, keep in mind, too, the, the fire service is much bigger than just uh, Cal Fire and the Forest Service. And I would say in general, if I was to focus specifically there in California, I think the relationships are great. In fact, I think that's why we're having so much success in that state is because of the fire service in general and how it's working together. 
I mean, there's always uh, problems when people work together, but uh, I can assure you that the leadership of those agencies and those local fire departments, they're committed to working through whatever issue that may come up, uh, but the relationship is solid. Well, my time's expired, and uh, Madam Chairman, thank you for allowing me to participate, but I, I would think it'd be helpful, uh, Chief, if you were to provide, if you have not already, uh, a list of uh, um, areas that you think we need to work on together to allow you to better do your job and thank, for myself, thank the firemen and women uh, and the people of the U.S. Forest Service for the her uh, heroic jobs that you're engaged in here always and certainly in terms of recent years during these uh, really terrible fire seasons we're dealing with. Thank you, Congressman Costa. Uh, thank you very much, Chief Moore, for your time. Uh, we're going to do a second round of questions for anyone interested. I'll continue in the same order. Um, and I'll begin by recognizing myself for five additional um, minutes. Uh, Chief Moore, in, in answers to prior questions, you talked about the 38% loss in staffing that you have experienced across um, non-firefighting uh, roles. Could you just give us a little bit more of a background of what those roles are and what the impact has been on your agency? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. Yeah, the, the, uh, the, the type of positions are those resource positions that actually do a lot of the resource work on the ground. And whether it's doing NEPA, which the Congressman just mentioned, or, or forest plan revision, but also it's going out putting structures out on the ground for wildlife purposes. Uh, it's going out doing um, surveys, uh, looking at some of the sensitive species that are taking place. It's also our foresters uh, that goes out and look at uh, the landscape and design our civil cultural practices for getting at some of the disturbances <clears throat> taking place on the landscape. So it's those resource related issues, you know, watershed improvements, whether it's uh, a soil science, hydrologists, some of those types of specialty uh, programs where we improve the landscape so that the types of fires that happen is not happening in a catastrophic way. Most of the fires, uh, most, you know, most of the land out west um, uh, is developed through fires. And so you have a lot of uh, fire adapted ecosystems out there. And so fire is a natural part of the landscape. And we need to make sure that fire continues to be a natural part of the landscape, but through controlled uh, uh, conditions. Uh, and we just have not been able to spend the necessary amount of time making improvements on the ground uh, that would also make that fire behave differently as it moves across the, the landscape. And Chief Moore, what I hear you describing is uh, an investment really in preventative efforts so that we're preventing those catastrophic fires so that we are um, making investments in the personnel who will prepare us um, and ensure that the land um, is not as susceptible to the sorts of catastrophic. Is that a correct assessment that that's that, the preventative? That's correct, Madam Chair. And, and the types of skill sets that those employees would bring, um, uh, is there a, a challenge that you all are facing that as we have, as you've experienced loss of these personnel predominantly related to funding, are you also then um, challenged by a loss of, of skill set and knowledge in terms of resiliency and in uh, uh, and, and, um, wild forest management? Uh, yes, we certainly lost a lot of skills and we've tried to mitigate that somewhat by partnering uh, with groups and, and, and other entities that have those skills. Okay. And so now what you see is a gradual shift in how the Forest Service is being managed. We're working more through others and with others than what we have in the past. And, that, and that's been a really positive thing. It's just that we need to have more capacity internally so that we can continue to, continue to work in that, that way. Because I think that this is the new generation of natural resource management in this country. But we need to have uh, those critical positions filled that would allow us to do more of this. Great. And Chief Moore, we passed um, 2.7, well, we, we passed the wildfire funding fix last year. Um, and I understand that about $2.7 billion of this funding has already been used thus far this year. Can you talk about how this funding authority um, impacts your ability to combat the growing number and increasing intensity of wildfires um, and, and how it might overall, how it is useful or, or how you all are using it? Any comments on that funding and its, its value to you? Yeah, yeah, first of all, I, I wanna thank Congress for the fire funding fix. It's really stopped the bleeding of these other program areas and so I think that that's been really good. 
Uh, I think now what we need to do is, is to be able to build those programs up so that we can do more of the work that I just talked about earlier. Uh, but, but certainly, uh, the fire fund and fix was one of the single most important things I think Congress could have done for the Forest Service uh, in recent years. And I hope we'll continue to talk about that program into the future uh, to receive uh, in our oversight function, uh, talk in greater detail about the, the benefits, challenges, and, and certainly the way that money has been deployed. Um, in my last 40 seconds, I would just ask, open it up to any other comments that you would like uh, to make before the committee focused on your goals or priorities. You know, I, I want to thank Congress um, for their interest and in what happens on America's forests and grasslands. And I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to work with Congress as we move into uh, this tenure uh, that I'm in. I, I'm just so appreciative. Thank you very much, Chief Moore. I now recognize Ranking Member LaMalfa for five minutes. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, let's, let's talk quickly about what we can do on the ground um, more immediately. Um, we, we talked before about the uh, BAER, the BEAR response. They're called the Burned, Emergency, Burned Area Emergency Response Teams. They're out, they're out doing the assessments post-fire of uh, what we have, what we can be doing. Now, um, I think the committee has the ability to put up on the screen uh, a map we have of what's known as the Feather River Watershed in, um, and illustrate what we're looking at with the immediate response that we really should be trying for. If you see on the screen there, the, um, the area in red is pretty much all this year, and that represents well over a million acres combined, the Beckworth Fire, the Dixie Fire, and those surrounding colors are just in the last four years of fire, all except for one tiny one that was back in, uh, well, tiny relatively, uh, I think the Moonlight Fire 2007, the scar you can still see. So what I'm, what I'm looking for, Chief Moore, is um, uh, we, we talk about looking things in the long term, but that Feather River watershed is an area that services uh, in the water that's uh, delivered and stored and ultimately makes its way to Californians. 25 million Californians rely on the water that comes from the state water projects. It's primarily filled by this area. So we talk about restoration and, you know, we've talked, you know, in whether it's going to be in one bill form or I, I had a legislation in a, in a previous bill. We got to pounce on this right now because when we're talking about the erosion, we're talking about the ash and the material that can be washing down the hill in the next couple of large rains we hope to have in the winter, right? Um, it's going to greatly affect the watershed and the water supply situation for our whole state. So. What does the forest need in order to start immediate restoration in a, in a volume or a pace and scale, so to speak, that can really, really make a difference in a short amount of time? We, uh, we have a window of time right now since we're still in September to, to we could be doing a lot before a rainy season uh, ensues. What, what can we pounce on right now uh, to, to be effective on uh, limiting damage from erosion, et cetera? Hey. Thank you, Rekha uh, Lamafa. So the first step that needs to be done is uh, assessments. We need to uh, send teams out to look at what are those emergency uh, types of things that need to take place immediately. And so that's the burn area emergency response um, that you had talked about there. Uh, so that's taking place now. We, we have a need, uh, based on this year's fires, we have a need of about 216 assessments that needs to be done. We've currently completed about 136 we are currently in the process of looking at the Dixie now. We've already looked at the Beckworth, and we've, um, I think we've committed somewhere around, um, uh, uh, I think about four, uh, 430, $440,000, and we're expecting to kick that up to much higher than that based on the continuous, the continuous needs that, that, uh, that we find. In terms of the Dixie fire, I agree with you, that's in a critical watershed. Uh, the Feather River watershed is really critical to the water supply, if you've indicated. And so my immediate uh, goal is to bring just a small team of key leaders in the agency out so that they can get a perspective of the amount of work that needs to be done. We also want to line up working with um, private uh, partners and others uh, because this is going to take a lot of us working together to try to get that area. Um, but Chief, Chief Moore, I'm sorry, our time is limited, but uh, 
we, we have an immediacy we need to have here. We need to be hauling straw, and we need to be you know making, uh, shaping waterways or in some fashion to not be devastating this year. And I appreciate that you have the teams out there doing that, but we need to take that information and turn it into immediate action. So ask, you know, and I, I proposed a very large amount of money in a, in a recent amendment to legislation here. It didn't, it, it didn't make it, but uh, uh, because the the, 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 the the size and the cost is going to be huge of what we're looking at. I, I agree with that. And just for your information, uh, some of those activities are currently taking place out there, but that was such a large area. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time to do a full assessment of what the needs are out there. But I agree, um, that's something that's very important uh, to the watershed of the state. What can uh, uh, partnering uh, with private industry help help speed this up? You know, the you know the people in the industry, timber industry, can they can they be a partner to help on this with uh, some of the dead tree removal and uh, putting something down on the ground that will stop erosion and the habitat well, da damage that's going to happen. Uh, yeah, absolutely they can, Congressman. And uh, I have an expectation that they would be engaged with us, uh, as well as other members of the community, to um, get some cover back onto the ground and get some of these um, structures in place. Okay, thank you. I yield back. The chair now recognizes Ranking Member Thompson if he'd like to ask another round of questions. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Chief, I'm going to circle around and give you an opportunity to respond. You know, I, I know the Forest Service has, again, done new research on where specifically the agency needs to perform restoration activities to reduce the threat of wildfire. Uh, so, so the question that we ran out of time on, how does the Forest Service intend to use this research and prioritize such projects? So, so thank you, Ranking Member. Um, so as we've indicated before, we have about 66 million acres that need to be treated. Uh, our researchers have been engaging with us, and we feel that if we treat about 20 million acres of those, that we would have a positive impact on the 66 uh, million acres there. I think the, the key is to have strategically placed landscape treatments across the, the, the area. We know we must protect uh, communities and also the infrastructure that those communities depend on. Uh, we also know that we need to protect the wildland as well. But life and property would be our first priorities, and that's where we're focused on uh, now. Very good. Hey, uh, Chief, uh, um, I know this is your first public appearance uh, before this committee, and we really thank you for that. Uh, much appreciate you uh, and your leadership. As you may know, our committee recently marked up a reconciliation measure that included many policy changes impacting the Forest Service and some $40 billion in forest-related investments, and quite frankly, did that without any public hearings, uh, any committee discussions. Um, so as Chief of the Forest Service, were you asked to provide input or testimony on, on those provisions within the budget recon reconciliation legislation? I believe that has been taking place before I uh, assumed this position, so I have not personally uh, been engaged at that level um, to answer your question. Okay. Uh, so, so the best of your knowledge, since you came into uh, into your position as force chief, and we're happy to have you there, uh, there, there was no request that came from this committee or the Senate committee or somewhere else for uh, for any kind of consultation. Uh, or to provide testimony or technical assistance on that bill? Yeah, well, I'm sure there, there, there is, at least I hope so, but I'm not aware <laughs> of what that might be at this point, Congressman. I, I would certainly hope that, uh, <laughs> that uh, I always hope so too, but uh, if you're not aware um, in your position, and again, I reinforce we really uh, appreciate you having there, you there, it's, uh, it's kind of sad. Uh, uh, this is uh, what we get uh, when they don't allow the the this committee, the agriculture committee, to do its job. Um, it's like throwing money at a wall. Uh, in my opening statement, I, I identified the fact that the lacking of authorities, the uh, just how um, uh, how flawed that is. You uh, 
Congress should not just throw money in it. We know wildfires are an issue. We know having healthy forests is so important, but that's why we have an agriculture committee, so that we can have hearings, we can have debate, we can have delivered a process. And this bill that's going to be voted on, and it was shoved through this committee, is just alarming, uh, absolutely alarming. Um, I don't think we want the leadership of either party writing writing our farm bills and including the forestry title. Now, can you shed, uh, uh, just changing gears uh, with the time I remaining, can you uh, shed any light on the working relationship between the Forest Service and CAL FIRE? I've been hearing reports of issues and now with the 60 Minutes report that uh, response to the Caldor fire was delayed due to conflict, it seems like this, this needs to be addressed. I, I, I think I have different information than you do, uh, Congressman. I'm not aware of any problem between the Forest Service and CAL FIRE. As I had indicated earlier, that relationship is, is really solid. So I, I'm not aware of, of anything that might be going on. All right. And I, I certainly don't take uh, uh, credible references from the media. So uh, um, uh, but I'll be glad to uh, certainly work with uh, Mr. Lamoff. I yield to Mr. Lamoff. Well, with the, yeah, with the gentleman yield. Um, I, I, I ran out of time on previous thoughts, but uh, indeed there is a lot on the ground that needs to be looked at, Chief Moore, on the relationship there. Uh, people that will come up to me off the record and tell me that uh, the philosophy between the two entities on how to attack fire, deal with fire, who's going to be in charge, um, there, there's big problems. And yeah, whether it's 60 minutes or what have you, um, there's people on the ground that uh, in feeling like, you know, regular firefighters that want to approach 60 minutes about this or were approached that feel very strongly about this. So we, need, we have a lot of patching to do, I think, on that relationship with the strain that's been on and the different philosophies on fighting fire. Uh, at the bottom, the bottom line is the American people, the public, they don't care what color the fire truck is that shows up to their fire, whether it's light green or red or yellow or what have you. They just want action. They want their community safe and that. So I, I thank uh, uh, Mr. Thompson for yielding to me. Thank you very much to the ranking members. The chair now recognizes Mr. O'Halloran for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I. Um, I'm just going to have a couple of comments based on what I heard and a couple of questions. Uh, my district has uh, all or six national forests. Some of them are in direct um, bordering on the Grand Canyon, which is in my district. And um, first of all, let me thank the administration for putting it up to $15 an hour, but that's a ridiculous number. Uh, these firefighters are away from their families for an extended period of time. I've been to a large amount of type one and type two incidents where I've seen these uh, young people coming off the line, exhausted, going into small tents and sleeping for a short period of time, and then getting back up and going out and risking their lives to save communities and our natural resources. Uh, and uh, th that is $15 an hour. Uh, I, I don't know where that number came from, but let's hope that we in Congress can do a lot better than that. And I know a lot of the firefighters that come from local jurisdictions uh, are side, side by side with them and working very hard also, but making a lot more money than, than they are and risking the same amount of life. Um, the other thing is the 38% loss of workforce. Uh, as you indicated, Chief, that was over a number of years. Uh, that was something that... Uh, was said time and time and time again. I've said it uh, the entire time I was in the legislature. I asked Congress to do something. Uh, since I've been in Congress, we've tried to find ways to address that issue. Uh, some of it have been, has been addressed, but the timeline is too short to be able to get it to, up to where we, we need it to be. But the idea that we just said, well, we'll just fight these fires and cut the workforce down, and of course, NEPA and all these other, those people are taken off the lines. Our type one people come right from the Forest Service. Uh, our, our, our firefighters, and, and, and they come right from the Forest Service. I see the offices uh, when, when they can't be as productive because the firefighter, they're out fighting fires. Um, and Mr. Panetta talked about law enforcement. Red Rock Ranger District in, in my district uh, has uh, Millions of visitors every year. They have two law enforcement officers. 
I, I, I'm a, law, a former law enforcement officer. I know that those officers are hardly out there because of days off, because of sickness, because of court time, uh, because of paperwork. There is no law enforcement in the Red Rock Ranger District, or for that matter, in the million plus acres of the Coconino National Forest or many other national forests around this country. Again, Congress has been not willing to put the money forward. And I'm glad to hear people start to talk about landscapes uh, work. Now, uh, we just had a couple of fires up in the district. Well, actually a lot of them, 14 in one weekend. But uh, the uncharacteristic fire severity is causing more post-fire flooding. Northern Arizona's, Arizona's know all too well. This summer, those living in Flagstaff neighborhoods below the museum fire from 2019 um, that, that are continuing, uh, the burn area is continuing to face severe flooding in areas that never flooded before. And then when, as you know, Chief, when this stuff comes out of that mountain, those mountains, it not only brings a ton of stuff down, but at the speeds it comes down those mountains, it, it just, just moves right into neighborhoods and just rips people apart. Um, and so, uh, and the intense fire behavior jeopardizes the long-term watershed health and water quality. Uh, what's your opinion on, on what we can do? I, I heard you say 60,000 acres of funding. Well, that, that, that's near ridiculous as far as why haven't we moved as fires have increased up to the higher levels? Thank you, Congressman O'Halloran. Uh, I, I, I think you uh, stated the problem very well. I, you know, I just wanted you to know that we're doing everything we can with what we have, and if we have more, we'll do more. Um, and, and but that's uh, that's for you all to decide in terms of what more looks like. I can assure you, though, we're committed um, uh, to the job that uh, that you all have uh, given us as as um, federal employees. And we're also committed to working with uh, people in the communities and our neighbors to look at landscape type treatments uh, rather than just uh, jurisdictional boundaries only. Thanks, so Chief. Uh, I just have to say that uh, the, the bear, th bear issue is huge. Uh, that uh, the, the uh, idea that uh, we also have the law enforcement issue uh, and you and I will talk about that later at some time. And I, Madam Chair, I will be sending in uh, more questions uh, for follow-up and also documentation for the record. Thank you very much. And the chair now recognizes Congresswoman Schreier from Washington for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, um, you know, I, want, I wanted to continue on. We were talking about the importance of thinning forests. And, um, you know, one of the one of the solutions is having mills. And in Washington State, we have very little mill infrastructure left. Um, and before um, harvesting and milling was done in a very irresponsible way, now we know how to do it really responsibly and support an industry and make our forests healthier at the same time. And uh, right now, without a mill nearby, it just doesn't pencil out. Um, public and private landowners have to truck logs 150 miles away to the nearest mills, high cost, they end up losing money. And so um, locating uh, a mill uh, in Chelan County where there is, again, 70% um, uh, of the forest land is, uh, is forest service land would be such a huge win-win situation. It would bring a ton of money to the Forest Service so you could raise wages and benefits and pay people more and get more uh, employees in. It would, uh, it would support more affordable housing. It would make us less reliant on foreign steel because we could build with cross-laminated timber. It, uh, and it would create a, a, a ton of family wage jobs. And so um, I, I've been in touch with our regional forester, uh, Glenn Casamasa, about this and just would welcome the opportunity to talk with you both more about whether we could have a reliable dependence on forest service logs. So do, can, you, can you talk a little bit about that? Who could go in and do the logging if you don't have the personnel to do it? Like, how can we make this work? So, uh, Congressman, I, I would first suggest um, 
that maybe we need to sit down and talk about uh, what the opportunities are, and then we could land on what the appropriate tool would be to, to do that. It's going to be very hard to answer that question in just a, a, a minute or so, but I would love to be able to sit down with you and Glenn and others uh, that may need to be involved to talk about this very issue because the same applies in so many other locations. So um, uh, I've got even better. You are invited and I will send you a formal invitation to come out to Washington state and lay eyes on, um, you know, areas of forest that have been appropriately managed and what happened there when a fire came through areas that haven't uh, and what happened there and the, like just the tremendous potential for um, for a big win-win. So please come to Washington State. Um, I also wanted to highlight one particular uh, landscape restoration project that's really important in my district. And I don't think you're going to have answers to these questions now, but I'll throw them out there and you can just reply later. Maybe you can even reply when you come out to Washington State. Um, this one's the Upper Wenatchee Pilot Project. And um, I'll, I'll be following up, as I mentioned, with your team, but I wanted to know uh, when an environmental assessment will be available for the public to review, uh, also when we can expect the final NEPA decision, and when we might be able to see work actually starting on the ground, because while this project is stalled, uh, land within the treatment area is currently burning as we speak. So Congresswoman, I did get a, a brief uh, briefing on this, very brief, but what I can tell you though, is that uh, the expectation is that NEPA should be out in spring or early summer. Uh, I think looking at the purpose and need for that project, I think it was really solid. It was really laid out well. And so now it's just a matter of working through the process, but I will look more into this and we can have a, a follow-up conversation on some specifics. That'd be fantastic. Obviously, the earlier, the better. Um, fire season starts early. So if we get that going in, in spring, um, that would help us with the, with the, next, um, the next season. Um, I, I think I'll leave it there and yield back the rest of my time. Thank you again for, for coming today and, uh, and facing some of these really big challenges. We understand how big they are and how much work you have cut out for you and also how important it is. Thanks. Yield back. Before we adjourn today, I invite uh, the ranking member to share any closing comments that he may have. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'll be brief on the close here. And I appreciate the comments like by Ms. Schreier, what she was saying there on, uh, um, we're gonna need a place for this material to go, you know, and we have a massive amount of material. So we do need to inspire those that want to invest in uh, the infrastructure to process wood you know, whether we're gonna make chips, or whether we're going to be able to you know, salvage some saw logs, whatever we can turn this material into, biochar, something that needs to be explored more. So I appreciate that. We have to have, the people that would invest need to have confidence that they can be over a 30 year period that they'll have a, a steady supply that we can guarantee from federal land. And uh, so that's, that's extremely important. Also, a lot of good positive comments and thoughts in committee here today. I, I was. Uh, uh, you know, working with Jimmy P there, uh, Mr. Panetta, on the legislation we're working on together along with our ranking, our, our chairwoman, I mean, uh, with, um, you know, part of it being prescribed fire. Now, prescribed fire is not going to be popular maybe at all times, but when you do a comparison of a controlled situation there and how we're going to reduce the, uh, the fuel load we have, uh, when we do it wisely, the right time of year, the right atmospheric conditions, it can be extremely effective and very minimal on annoyance, you know, so it, it's, it's all, it's all goes together. I appreciate Mr. Costa bringing up on the, the forest plan needing update for many years. I, I also would caution that we also move very quickly um, on the ground as we can with executive actions or what have you in order to uh, do what we can to offset the problems we've had with current fire and, and the salvage needs to be done. You know, an update of a plan, Mr. You know, Chief Moore. I don't know if that might take three or four years or what, but we we obviously, in my view, really need to move quickly and adeptly on uh, where um, where we need to go for the immediate cleanup and what we can do to get ahead of the curve on setting fire breaks and and other things to help defend communities and more forest land. And uh, 
Also, Ms. Pingray, she's been very kind in this committee and other, other previous ones on, on uh, looking at the situation, and I know she wants to be a partner as well. So with that, I think we had a really good start today on, on this discussion during this 2020 on fire season of where we can go. So Madam Chair, I really appreciate your diligence and for uh, making this time for us today. And I thank you again, uh, Chief Moore, for your, uh, your time and, um, and uh, let's continue to work together and uh, get all this together and get our, get our CAL FIRE and U.S. Forest Service thing ironed out too. We'll, we'll, we'll have more to follow up with you on that as well. So anyway, um, thanks a lot. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. LaMalfa. Again, I want to thank you, Chief Moore, for joining us today, uh, for taking the time to answer our questions, to engage with this committee. I hope that it is the beginning of a very productive uh, conversation and relationship as you continue to um, grow in your role. Again, congratulations on the role that you've assumed. I, I think the conversations of today have been pr pretty broad. Um, everything from the pay of firefighters to the stability of the workforce, the challenges uh, that the Forest Service is facing, that you're facing in hiring and, and retention. Uh, those are things that need to be at the forefront of our mind. Uh, the conversations related to science-based treatments and prevention and forest maintenance certainly is something that we talk about in this committee, and so it was great uh, to have you uh, bring your perspective of what is currently happening and what more needs to happen. Uh, the conversations related to uh, lack of, um, uh, you know, Mill and infra mill infrastructure throughout the United States, and what that actually means uh, when we're looking at some of our prevention intentions. Um, my colleague from Maine, who spoke about uh, cross laminated timber and some of the forest product research that's happening uh, within uh, the the Forest Service, I think is is really bringing a fulsome discussion to the work that that your agency does, and and frankly. Uh, the focus that we as a subcommittee uh, do have on the, the beginning to the end discussion related to how uh, not only are we fighting the forest fires, but frankly, how are we preventing them and what are some of the um, hindrances and challenges that, that you and your colleagues face. And, and certainly the threat of wildfire continues to increase every year, and we have heard some of the, uh, the real challenges faced back home in the districts of so many of the members on this committee. So I appreciate you um, listening to the very specific stories and impact that it's had on the, com the communities represented uh, by this committee. I do look forward to our continued work together. Uh, certainly the task moving forward continues to be daunting, um, but I hope that we will be a partner um, in ensuring that the United States Congress is doing all that we can do uh, to prevent uh, forest fires to prevent the economic um, and land devastation, um, and certainly to be uh, supportive of the men and women on the front lines of that. And so um, as we close out this hearing, I just want to convey my appreciation to your entire workforce, and particularly the firefighters who are risking their lives to keep our community safe. Um, and, and certainly we are so grateful for their service, um, and we will continue to work with you on issues of oversight and issues of engagement. Uh, to ensure that the work that they are performing um, is, is optimized and that we are as supportive as we can, because certainly we are grateful. Uh, under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplementary written responses from the witnesses to any question posed by a member. This hearing of the Subcommittee on Conservation and Forestry is now adjourned. Got a dash. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you. Okay.